in the past where the churches that they belonged to years ago, just how corrupt they've gotten in all these years. He showed me a picture of a man that uh, he uh, was a pastor that was his pastor back several, several years ago. And this guy preached revivals everywhere. I mean, he, he just did all kinds of things, simply of God preacher. And he has gotten hooked up in witchcraft. And I mean, literally witchcraft, blatantly witchcraft. And has turned himself over to a reprobate mind, conscience seared with a hot iron, goes to a universalist church now. And it's just awful what this man has become. He shared with me other pastors that he's known that become sodomites. I mentioned um, a gospel. I mentioned a gospel singer this morning that he knew, but he had not heard that story. And then I brought up another gospel singer that it came out and admitted that he was a sodomite named Ray Bolts and. When I mentioned Kirk Talley this morning, Kirk Talley, he repented of the sins he had done, didn't want to be that way. He just didn't want it. He knew it was wrong, knew that um, he was in danger. God had got a hold of him. I prayed for him over the years. I've never met the man, but I've just anybody who struggles with sin and doesn't want to be a sinner. I'm always on their side, always on their side. My fear is at some point they may just give up fighting, turn themselves over. I don't know if that's what he's done. But with that singer Ray Bolts who wrote, I mean, he wrote great songs. When he announced that he was coming out of the closet, he's a homosexual. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, I don't want to be this way. He dives into it full fledged, starts singing. The only churches that will have him now is these metropolitan community churches, which are the gay churches in every city. And that man told me, he said, do you know who he married? And I said, no. He said, he married a guy that is one of the leading distributors of pornography in this country. Sodomite. And I said, well, I guess he doesn't want to come back. And that kind of stuff is going on everywhere. Churches becoming desensitized to it, desensitizing their members, members of the churches, because now they find out they've got sodomites in their family. They won't speak out against it. They don't want it spoken out against because they don't want their family members to be offended. They want everybody to go along with it. God made them that way. Who are we to judge? All that kind of nonsense. And that's what's happening right now. So you need that breastplate of righteousness to shield you, to guard your heart against being turned over. See, you don't have to be a sodomite to be pro-sodomite. You can be straight and be in favor of sodomites. You're still just as guilty in God's eyes as they are. Romans chapter 1 says that you are just as guilty as they are. So anyway, we, we had a good, uh, he took us out to eat for lunch, had a good time. Malicia, remind me, I, they want to be on our watchers list, so I got their name and address. I wrote it down there in my office, all right? But uh, he wanted to convey to our church his thanks for uh, just how we've helped him and his wife and their walk with the Lord and things like that. So we had a good time. I, I look for him to come back sometime, don't know when. I can say they live up in the Peoria area, which is not all that far from here. So uh, it was just good to visit with them and had a good time, had a good lunch with them. Genesis chapter 14. Did you do your homework? We're going to take a poll now on who Melchizedek is. Is he Jesus? Is he just an angel? 
Is he neither? Is he a guy on this earth? Originally, years ago, that's what I thought. I'd never really considered the idea that there could be an angelic priesthood. But I can't remember what book it was. It was one of these old books that you find on Google Books. I like those, some of the theological ones. Because they're interesting reading. A lot of them are just pretty dead on. That's because there wasn't the infiltration of false Bibles back then. But some of them you got to watch out for because they're wacky. But anyway, I was introduced to that idea. I never thought about that before. But I, I went, I, I think the guy's right. The more I studied the scripture, the more I was convinced that, yes, there was an angelic order of priests. And that Christ was the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Yes. Yeah, we're going to go there in a little bit. Okay, so you're on page you're on page eight. I'm on page one. We'll get to page eight here in a little bit. All right. Genesis 14, verse 17. The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedorlaomer. And of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, which is what we do at communion. And he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand and he, Abraham, or Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. Again, this was before the law. So anybody who says, I don't have, believe I have to tithe because that was part of the law. We're not under the law. This wasn't under the law either, but he, he did it anyway. Did it out of a pure heart. Did it out of a willing heart. Did it out of a loving heart, which is how you ought to be doing it uh, to begin with. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you, God, that you open up our eyes and our hearts. So we study your word. Father, we believe that this word is faithful and true in everything that it says. And Father, there's just some things we don't know. And even after tonight, Lord, after we've studied it, uh, we may still have questions. I still do. Lord, one of these days, the faith that we have is going to become sight. The questions that we have unanswered will be answered. We will know even as now we are known because we will be like you. And Lord, you know me. I want to know every answer to every question. I don't like keeping riddles and secrets and mysteries from me. God, I want to find them all out. But Lord, it sure is fun to study them. It sure is fun to seek these things out. So Father, would you illuminate us and show us, Father, uh, a little bit about what heaven's like and about how you've done things. Just bless your word and honor it. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Now, turn to Psalm 110. We'll kind of do this in order. Um, I don't know who's trying to get my attention here. All right. So anyway, uh, just kind of going around the room. I know John said last Sunday that he at one time thought it might be Christ, but then he kind of changed his mind back a little bit. If that's something, is that kind of how you said it, John? Okay. So does anybody have where they think that Mel Melchizedek is in fact Jesus? Because we know Jesus made appearances in the Old Testament. We know he did. So who in here thinks that Melchizedek is Jesus? Raise your hand. One, two, le trois, four, bub. Bub knows. Okay. Who thinks Melchizedek is a high angel, but not Christ? Uh-oh. There's a church split coming, sure enough. Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn. Let me turn my Bible there. Psalm 110, we'll maybe get the gist of this, maybe get the, the context of it so we kind of know what we're talking about. 
Let's start. In fact, let's do that. Let's start in verse one of Psalm 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, who, who's the Lord and who's the Lord that he's talking about? The Lord said unto my Lord. Who's he talking about? He's talking, if you notice the capitalization of the first Lord. That's the yod heh vah the Jehovah. The Lord, Jehovah, said unto my Lord, Sit thou at, thy, at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Well, we know from the New Testament, that was God the Father saying to God the Son, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies your footstool. In other words, when I put your enemies under your feet, you'll be sitting at my right hand until I do those things. So it's God talking to God. God talking to his son, who is also the Lord. Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, and in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Then he said, the Lord, capital O-R-D, hath sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath, and he shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. Now, in the prayer, when the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, show us how to pray. Teach us to pray. Jesus said, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what he's saying is that there's coming a day when God's kingdom is actually established on the earth that that which is done in heaven and has been accomplished in heaven will finally be done here on the earth. So anything that's in the earth is merely a diminished or a smaller representation of what's in heaven. When God instructed Moses, build me the tabernacle. Here's what, here's the length, the width, the breadth I want you to make it. Here's the material I want you to make it out of. Here's the number of poles that I want around both sides. Here's the number of poles I want across the back. Here's the number of pillars in the front. Here's the number of boards that go down the north side, the south side, the back side. Make the ark out of shittim wood, which was like thorn tree. Uh, the, um, what are they called in Kenya? I can't think of them. But anyway, you had these thorn trees, that thorn wood is what they were to make the ark out of. They would overlay it with gold. And what God was saying, told Moses, he said, see that thou make it according to that which I've shown you in the mount. God apparently opened up heaven and let Moses see the temple of God in heaven and how it was built, what it looked like, what the Ark of the Covenant looked like, what the table of showbread looked like, what the menorah looked like. All of those things, he showed him what they looked like. Moses had that in his image. And he said, now, that when you get ready to build this thing, you remember how it looks, and I want what's built to look exactly like that. No difference in it whatsoever. So not only did Moses have it in his mind, but Moses had a man that God said he would fill with the Spirit of God, and God would give this man the exact look, the dimensions, the exact colors he wanted, how much gold was to be laid over it, and so on, so that there was absolutely no difference. If you were to look at the one in heaven, look at the one in earth, they would be the same thing. That is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we know that God has angels now in heaven that give attendance to 
the temple of God that is in heaven. When he instituted the Levites as a priesthood on earth, the job that he gave to each of those Levites, they, were, they had their own courses. In other words, a group of Levites out of one family, they did one thing in the temple service. Another family of the Levites, in other words, son of the Levites, they did another thing. Some of them carried out the daily ministration, the daily sacrifice. Some of them, all they did was they were responsible for packing up the tabernacle just in, a, in an exact, perfect way and then causing it to be carried from one campsite to the next. That was the whole of their job. Others were of the line of high priests. Others were involved in sacrifice. Others were involved in examining the animals. Others were involved in taking out the ashes out of the altar. Others were involved in baking the bread, making sure the, the show bread on the table was fresh every day and so on. In other words, everybody had their task. These were copied out of things that were already being done in heaven every single day. God didn't do anything different with the Levitical priesthood that, was all, that wasn't already happening up in heaven. So the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the bottom line is we have an angel. It could be Christ, the way some of you believe. It could be just another angel. But we have an angel of the Lord who is sort of the, um, I guess, the boss, the master, the ruler over all of the other angels who act as ministers of the temple of God in heaven. It is called the order of Melchizedek. It is named after him. The earthly representation of that was the order of Aaron. You have the Aaronic priesthood. And after a while, every, you'd have a, a priest that would go bad, like with Eli. Eli was a high priest and he was a judge. And because of Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, God said, I'm going to end the order of Eli and there will no more be any sons in Eli's family to be high priest in their father's stead. And sure enough, the day of the battle came between the Philistines and Israelites, Hophni and Phinehas were killed in that battle. So when Eli died, that was it. His seed, his family, was no more to be part of the Aaronic priesthood. God had changed it over now to Samuel. Samuel was now the high priest. And so it was the order of Samuel after him. Okay, so... And that was the, I, like I said, I never thought about it before. I'm reading this book and I'm going, well, I'll be. There is an angelic priesthood who is named after this particular angel by the name of Melchizedek. And it is this Melchizedek that is the king of Salem that Abram meets, this Melchizedek blesses Abram. Abram gave him tithes of all. He gave him 10% of everything that he had. Now, Hebrews 5. What did you say, Hebrews 7, Chris? Well, in Hebrews 7, we're talking about Abraham gave a tenth part of all, uh, earthly by interpretation, king of righteousness. Right. King of Peace. Right. Right. So Hebrews 5. Let's, uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 6, but let's read down to get the context. And Hebrews really is that 
uh, and Matthew does this too. Matthew being the first book of the New Testament is a transitional book that transitions us from thinking that our religion is all based upon what's on the outside and what can be seen to what's on the inside that cannot be seen by men, but God sees it. And if you study Matthew, you'll see Jesus does that. He said, you know, you've heard it shall be, you know, an eye for an eye. But I tell you, and he goes on to tell him something different. You have heard, you've heard it said that, you know, if anybody swear by the temple, it's okay. But if they swear by the gold of the temple, that's not right. But I tell you this. So Matthew is one of those books where you can see a clear changeover from the way the Jews thought before that, which was the religion was all on the outside and it was based on how you look on the outside, to Jesus pointing out, uh, I'm sorry, the outside can look really nice, but the inside can be full of disgusting maggots. Okay? So in Hebrews chapter 5, Verse 1, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. He's talking about the earthly priesthood. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And that what that means is, Whenever, let's say, John and his family, they go to the tabernacle and they bring their, their lamb, their spotless lamb. It's going to be a sacrifice. They bring it to a priest. Before the priest can offer their lamb for their sacrifice for his family's sins, the priest have to offer a portion of that for his own sins. And I like that. I like that because it never elevates nor allows to be elevated the priesthood. What do we have? Those of you who used to be Roman Catholic, what do we have? An elevation of the priesthood. The priests are it. The priests are the only ones who can hear from God. The priests are the only ones who know God. The priests are the only ones who talk to God. The priests are the only ones who can forgive your sins. The priests are the only ones who can absolve you. They, they're it. And they're elevated above everybody else. And the pretend is... That when they're called into the priesthood, God overflows them with supernatural power so that they never have any sexual desire, which is a joke. Big joke. Because they abuse everything. You want a book to read on this? Go to Google Books and look for The Priest, The Woman, and The Confessional. It's written by a Catholic Canadian priest in the mid-1800s by the name of Charles Chiniqui. And he was someone who God had pulled him out of the priesthood and saved him. And he knew, he knew what priests were doing with young girls in the confessional. He knew it. Okay? And he exposed it. So anyway, um, so he's establishing this idea that there is a heavenly priesthood. Where was it? Hebrews 5? Uh, verse four, and no man taketh this honor to unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Which that part there leads me to believe that Christ is not Melchizedek. That he was named a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Because to me it's like, why call Christ a priest after the order of Christ? If Christ is Melchizedek. And I, I do see where other people are coming from who believe that Melchizedek is Christ. I do get it. So some say potato, some say potato. But it's still good mashed with gravy on it. Right? So, um, 
So also Christ glorified not himself to be many out of high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, to thee have I gotten begotten thee, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And again, I just, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing here that if Melchizedek were Christ, I'm guessing, I'm not demanding, I'm not pounding my fist saying it has to be this way. But I'm questioning why God would not call it the order of Christ. After all, he does call Christ the chief shepherd, the chief apostle, the chief bishop, the chief prophet, the chief priest, the, the lamb, the unspotted lamb. He's the greatest of everything that we see in the Bible. But he's not calling this order that Jesus is the high priest of. He's not calling it the order of Christ. He's calling it the order of Melchizedek. So, again, potato, potato. Uh, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. That's all of us. So there's just enough mystery in the Bible, I think, number one, that number one, when I see a mystery in the Bible, I want to know what it is. But God hasn't shown me every mystery in the Bible. Still makes me want to know what it is. But number two, I think there are things in this Bible that probably we're not ever going to understand until we are like Christ. Then we'll know him for we shall see him as he is. Then we'll know, I believe we'll know everything. You're going to get to know who killed JFK. Trust me. You're going to get to know. Okay. And so he said, um, Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto them, unto him that was able to save him from death and, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, being made perfect until he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. For when the time, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and it becomes such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. There are times that I feel like I'm not qualified to teach certain things because I don't know them. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, Hebrews 6. We're getting there to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 6. I have verse 19, but let's back up a little bit and get the context. Um, verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Immutability means what? What does it mean to be immutable? Unalterable. He does not change. And you ought to be glad. Amen. That the God that promised you eternal life and salvation is not going to wake up and, and say, you know, I really don't like Gary. I don't like him. 
I just don't, I don't want him around. Don't worry, Gary. He is immutable. Meaning he does not alter the thing that goes forth out of his lips. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change his thoughts. He doesn't change his doctrine. He doesn't change the way he does things. He's the same God yesterday, today, forever. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Verse 18. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's like three times now. That he said, Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek. To me, that means... That the originator of the order was God going through Melchizedek. But that Jesus became the high priest of that order of Melchizedek. To me, Melchizedek and Jesus are two different characters. That's just kind of how I see it. Now in chapter 7, he says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is the last part of the word Jerusalem, and it comes from the Hebrew word Shalom, even the Arabic word they use in Islam, Salam, means peace. And that's what Salem or Shalem means, Shalom. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, now... I see your point. That if anybody's the king of righteousness, it would be Christ. And after that also, king of Salem, which is king of peace. That matches Isaiah 9, where it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Shalom. Prince of Peace. So King of Peace, Prince of Peace, same thing, same title. So I do get that. Then notice what he says. Now, I think it's also possible... That Melchizedek, not being Jesus, can be a type of Jesus. Was not David king of the Jews? He was king of all Israel. In fact, turn to, uh, hold your place there in Hebrews 6. I'm going to put my bookmarker there. And turn to Ezekiel. 37. Ezekiel 37. We have the prophecy of the dry bones. We have God telling Ezekiel, now take the two sticks. One of them represents the ten tribes of Israel. One of them represents the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And you're going to bind them together and they're going to be one stick. Because I'm going to Bring the nation of Israel back together again. I'm going to put them together again and there'll be one nation again. And so he said, um, if you look in verse 22, 
of Ezekiel 37. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. In verse 24, and David, my servant, shall be king over them. Now, who is David? Huh? It's Jesus. But he calls him David. He is son of David. Here it doesn't say son of David. It says David. David, my servant, shall be king. Now, God's not going to bring David back from the dead out of the crypt of his fathers and set him up as king. God's not going to do that. God's got a better king than David. David sinned. Jesus didn't. So in that, David played a part, a type, a characterization of Jesus. He was a man after God's own heart. That's Jesus. He's the one that put down all of the enemies. That's Jesus. So when he says David here, he is definitely referring to Jesus. But there was a real David who was not Jesus. But we can see in the life of David how he fits the character of Jesus. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's kind of how I see the Melchizedek issue. I believe Melchizedek was a uniquely separate angel, but that he acted the typology, the part of Jesus Christ and the things of his character, the things of his nature and what he did. He is a forerunner of Jesus Christ, a living prophecy of Jesus Christ, but not Jesus himself. Again, but that's my opinion. I don't know, Megan, should I let him? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, I'm just, it just occurred to me, could it, could it be that uh, it's two names for the same person because Jesus has to do with man and humans? Right. Melchizedek was an angelic order, so could it be a separate name for Jesus for the angelic side of things and Jesus is the human side of stuff? Yeah, I get that. I do, I get that. Um, we know that in um, Revelation 19, he's got a name written that no man knows. Okay, he's got a name written that no man knows, but he himself. Okay, what name is that? We don't know. I think we'll get to see it one of these days. We'll know it. So, yeah, I can kind of see what you're saying there, too. Again, I've never punched anybody in the face over this one. Never have. Yeah. Yeah. So for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Shalom, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. That's another thing on my side. That he's made like unto the Son of God. Okay? So to me, that tells me that, again, like what I said, Melchizedek is playing the part of Jesus in this play is Melchizedek, son of nobody, father of nobody, uh, but made like unto the son of God, abideth a priest continually, meaning that when Aaron died, his priesthood died. And so someone had to take the place of Aaron. And when they died, their priesthood died. Someone had to take their place. But because angels are immortal, 
they live forever, then Melchizedek can abide a priest forever. So can Jesus. Abide as a priest continually. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. In other words, Melchizedek what could not have been of the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi wasn't born yet. But we know the tribe of Levi was in the loins of Abraham at that time, waiting to make their appearance. Um, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. In other words, Melchizedek was of a higher form than Abraham was. And Abraham gave life to the Levitical priesthood. So, and the Bible is going to tell you here that when Abraham paid tithes, so did Levi. Through their father Abraham. Okay? Because whatever Abraham gave them, he, de he deducted it off the inheritance to his children. Okay? So, verse 8, And here men that die receive tithes. But there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may say so, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection, and here's the whole point Paul's making here. Whether it's Jesus or whether it's not, here's the main emphasis of this. This is not what's to be fought about. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, which the Jews believed, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now you remember. Levi was, you had Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, in that order. Levi was the third son of Jacob. Judah was the fourth son. Moses and Aaron were from Levi. So the Aaronic priesthood was from the third born son, Levi. And that tells me that it was always intended to be a priesthood of this world only. But Christ didn't come from Levi. He came from Judah. The fourth son. And I remember seeing this for the first time and I'm going, oh, that's it. Because if Christ then is of an angelic order of priesthood, that's why he's born of Judah, number four, not of Levi, number three. Because he's born of that spiritual realm, which is what that number four represents. If he would have been born of Levi, he would have been a priest like all the other Levites, offering temporary sacrifices to give salvation only on a temporary basis. And at the end of the year, they were all guilty again of their sins and they had to have the Day of Atonement and had their sins forgiven again for a year. Then it had to be done again next year and next year and next year. But now that Jesus comes from an everlasting priesthood, all he has to do is die once. And his sacrifice covers the sins of mankind forever. Amen. Now, that part we ain't going to fight about. Amen? Amen. That's the good part right there. Um, let's see here. After the order of Aaron. What, what verse was that? Verse 11 of chapter 
7. Yeah, verse 10, for yet he was in the loins of father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should uh, rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Now, verse 12, for the priesthood being changed. See, the law, the law that God gave Moses only made an allowance for a Levitical priesthood. There was nothing, not one word in the law that God gave Moses about a priesthood from Judah. Not once. So he said, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. And there was. Instead of do and live, it is believe and live for he of whom these sayings are spoken pertaineth to another tribe judah of which no man gave attendance at the altar for it is evident that our lord sprang out of judah not levi of which tribe moses spake nothing concerning priesthood so we're operating from a different law not a law sent down by an earthly mediator to an earthly people on the earth. A law from heavenly places sent by a heavenly mediator to those who would believe it. Amen to that. So, uh, verse 15, and yet is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Chalk one up for my side. Read that again. It is yet far more evident for after the ordertude, after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Melchizedek was the similitude. Christ was the priest of the order of Melchizedek, but not Melchizedek. Who was made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. He's talking about the law of Moses. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. So, whether you believe that Melchizedek was Jesus, or you believe that Jesus was not Melchizedek, you still have the same doctrine. That because Jesus did not come from Levi, he came from Judah, number four. That means he is from a heavenly realm of priests that came down here to offer not physical sacrifices, spiritual ones. And that it wasn't the blood of the lamb or the goats or the calves or the turtle doves or anything like that that temporarily atones for the sins of mankind. It is the one time offering of Jesus blood for all mankind forever that atones for all of our sins, past, present, future. One sacrifice only is necessary. Somebody say amen. So what is a Catholic priest doing? He's doing, he's violating the very nature of this law. He's turning what he believes, the host and the wine, back into the physical body and blood of Jesus, crucifying the Son of God afresh and making him an open shame. That's what every Catholic priest does every Mass is that they're putting Christ to an open shame all over again. They say, we have to re-crucify him every time you sin. That's a joke. I will fight over that one. Amen. And I got some more verses that kind of go into um, the, the different nature and character of angels as they show forth their heavenly priesthood. But we won't get into that tonight. All right. So... 
Again, if you, if you still believe that Christ was Melchizedek, that's fine. I'm, I'm not hung up over that. Um, but the fact that he came from an angelic heavenly order of priests and not from an earthly priesthood tells us that we're not following earthly laws. We're following a spiritual law that just, it's easier to fulfill that one because my flesh stays out of it. Can your flesh love your neighbor? No, your flesh wants to go against your neighbor. Can your flesh love God? No, it wants to go against God. But can your spirit do it? That's how you know. Let's stand to our feet. Those of you who are wrong, stay after for about 15 minutes. And repent. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, I, you won't have to repent if you can hold two dictionaries out at arm's length for five minutes. I had a teacher, Mr. Bradley, that uh, I liked him. If you got detention, that was the deal. You could get 30 minutes detention or five minutes holding two dictionaries out at arm's length like this. No one, no one made it. You can't even hold your arms out that long for five minutes. Father, thank you for a new law, a new priesthood. A priesthood, Lord, not of men who might turn us away if they don't like us. A priesthood of men who obviously corrupted the law of God, changed the law of God, made the law of God of no effect. And God, we would be lost, lost, lost if it weren't for you coming down from heaven from a better priesthood, offering a better sacrifice with a better covenant and a better intercessor, a better mediator, better promises, a better hope. Thank you, God, for doing that. That makes salvation easy. And we thank you for that. Be our priest forever. Intercede for us forever. As you stand at the right hand of God, bearing our petitions and our prayers. Teach us then, Father, that we ought to pray often. Because you never leave the right hand of your Father, bearing our prayers to him. You never left and you never will. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us. Teach us great and mighty things. Bless those as we go out this week, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.